this is a shoe. This one right here is the base model. It's good for covering your feet, little light walking. That's about it. This particular one, women, size six and a half. What if I took an identical shoe, gave one to everyone in the audience, and told you to put it on? For some of you, that is going to go fine. For others of you, it's going to go quite poorly if you need a men's size 15, for example. But it's more complicated than that. What if you were about to go run a marathon? What if it's snowing? So it would seem that not all of us are covering our feet for the same reason or have the same size feet at all. And this is going to impact my ability to help you cover your feet. So I need to rethink it. Why am I talking about shoes? I'm talking about shoes because they evolve over time. We as humans are never going to stop updating, refining, and redesigning our shoes. We're not going to finish shoes. And we as enthusiastic shoe wearers are totally on board with this. New discoveries on body mechanics, waterproof compounds, new styles, new fabrics. We can't wait to see what's coming next. Shoes use science, but they're also an excellent metaphor for science. We don't finish shoes, and we don't finish science. Wherever we are in a given enterprise is not where we end. The more things we learn, the more questions we have, the more work we do, the more we discover. Wherever you are in a given scientific enterprise is not the end. I've been a research scientist for 25 years, but I've loved science much longer than that. I was five years old when my view of science changed completely. You see, I thought science was static, fixed. I thought that what we knew was what we would always know, and that's the end of it. But then I started to overhear stories about something that was happening something that changed my view of science completely. It's not static, it's not fixed, and it never will be. That something was scary, terrifying. It started in 1981, focused largely in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, young men began dying in some of the strangest and most tragic ways. Almost to a person, they'd been in peak health just a few months before. And then suddenly, they were plagued with chronic fevers, with debilitating night sweats. Some developed pneumonia, others developed this rare aggressive skin cancer that covered their bodies and killed them within a few weeks to a few months. Still others, developed inflammation in their brains that led to profound dementia as though they were 95 years old rather than 25. Their doctors didn't know who to call for help or if these strange cases were even related at all. Perhaps it was some sort of horrible coincidence. The only things that these patients had in common were that a few of them knew each other, most were openly gay, and they were all suffering from diseases that do not usually make healthy people sick. One thing was clear. Help was urgently needed. This was a situation that called for shoots. And here, at the start of the AIDS crisis, we didn't even have this. Our patients were barefoot. In the beginning, we knew nothing. Was this some sort of shared chemical exposure? Was it a strange new form of clinical exhaustion? Was it a bizarre new virus? All of these possibilities were equally plausible, but they all would require a vastly different solution, a different shoe. Did they need a beach sandal or did they need a snow boot? New crises that require scientific solutions often have this feature. 
the first thing you try is almost never the last thing, and it's almost, at times, certain to have a level of error. Sometimes it's completely wrong. Let me give you an example. In the beginning, these young men were told to avoid something called poppers, which were these recreational inhalant drugs. The thought there was that perhaps there was some sort of chemical contaminant in some of the batches that was destroying the immune system of these patients, leaving them vulnerable to these strange infections and cancers. Now here in 2023, we've known for quite some time that AIDS is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. However, at that point, it was just a possibility one of many. If we think of HIV and AIDS as a snowstorm, that advice to have patients avoid using poppers would have been the equivalent of handing them something like this. This is obviously the wrong shoe. But it became clear very quickly that this was the wrong shoe. And we put it down and refocused our efforts accordingly. HIV itself was discovered in 1983, two years after those first cases presented. Now, from our vantage point, 1981 and 1983 do not seem terribly far apart. However, we only need to think back to our own recent communal experience with disease, COVID, to understand how truly terrifying that must have been for those at risk. Think back to those first few COVID months, the chaos, the confusion, the fear, not knowing would my partner be next? My friends? Would I? Stretch that over years. And that's how those patients would have felt. It was difficult to give comfort at first because we didn't know what was causing the disease. Therefore, we didn't know how to test for it. There was no way to know who was infected and who wasn't, who was going to die soon and who wasn't. That didn't happen until 1985. So for four years, scientists worked and patients waited for some shoe, any shoe, that would be helpful. Part of that work involved identifying the true scope of those patients who were at risk because these same unusual clusters of symptoms had started to appear in patients other than young men in big cities. Some were folks with substance use disorder who reused and shared needles to inject drugs. Others were their sex partners. Still others were patients who'd received multiple blood transfusions or their sex partners. And still others were babies that were born to patients in any of the above categories. It was helpful to understand this scope because it gave us one of our first breakthroughs in metaphorical shoe technology. These patients very closely mirrored another group, those who were at risk for hepatitis B. It seemed very likely that these two diseases were probably transmitted the same way. And so if the intervention we give to patients to avoid contracting hepatitis B or, say, a rain boot, perhaps that same intervention would be helpful for patients to avoid contracting AIDS. Now, if AIDS is a snowstorm, we need a snow boot. But in the meantime, this rain boot is going to give us a lot more protection than that white sneaker, which is going to give us more protection than nothing. Were we done at that point? No, of course we weren't. But the science had begun the process of improving. We were learning more. In the late 80s, we had the approval of our first drug to treat AIDS. Lives began to extend. We had our first snow boot. Now, would you wear a boot like this to climb a mountain in the middle of February? No, of course you wouldn't. But in a snowstorm, you'd rather be wearing this than that. And you'd rather be wearing that rain boot than that sneaker. And you'd rather be wearing that sneaker than nothing. 
we also had our first vaccine trial. It used all the latest, sexiest, most stylish technology. It was beautifully designed, came together brilliantly on paper. And yet, somehow in reality, it just didn't work. <laughs> but that's okay. You put it down, you move on, and you hope there are no embarrassing pictures. Back in 1981, when those first patients presented and died so tragically, we didn't know what to expect. 10 to 15 years later, we discovered new classes of drugs to help treat them. And we found, better yet, if we gave them as a cocktail, that they would fight the virus on multiple fronts and stop it from replicating completely. Our patients were still infected, but they no longer progressed to AIDS. We found the snow boot with a lifetime warranty and everything. We found the snow boot that would help protect their feet in the snowstorm that is AIDS. When patients are diagnosed as HIV positive now, we get to tell them about this long-term chronic condition that they have that's quite manageable with regular medications. We get to tell them that they will not die young, that they stand to live long, healthy lives. At first, we didn't know what they would be walking through. And metaphorical Gore-Tex had not been invented yet. As much as it would be super fun to make the opposite statement, we're scientists, we're not wizards. We can't give you the magic solution on day one, and if we give you a solution on day one, you maybe don't want that. Because the worst thing we could do is hand you this, and then assume we're done. Because this might be better in a snowstorm than no shoe at all, but you're still probably going to get frostbite. We also can't figure out every perfect solution for every foot because we need time. We need time to figure out all the feet and what it is they'll be walking through. We need time for our understanding to evolve. And as that understanding evolves, we may recommend different things, different interventions, different shoes, and that's okay. That's okay. It doesn't mean anyone was lying when they recommended the rain boot for the snowstorm. It means Gore-Tex hadn't been invented yet. And in the meantime, that rain boot was safer than that sneaker, which was safer than nothing. Humans are never going to stop refining and redesigning our shoes. Science is no different. If you finish science, you're doing it wrong. Let me say that again. If we finish science, we're doing it wrong. To bring science and shoes together in the most literal possible way, we may need to walk on Mars someday and we'll probably need updated footwear to do it. Humans are never going to finish a lot of things, but two of those things are science and shoes. That space right there, that's for the next shoe that we need, for the next crisis we face. We don't know what it is yet, but we'll figure out what shoes to put there. It may take us some time, it may take us a few tries. Undoubtedly, it'll need both but we'll figure it out because we're scientists and that's what we do. Thank you.